Hello and welcome to Bad Hasbara, the world's most moral podcast. In the entire world of podcasts, we are the most moral. Uh, thank you all for listening to uh, another episode. Uh, I, my name is Matt Lieb. I'll be uh, one of your two hosts for today. That's right. Daniel Mate is back. Uh, before we get started, once again, just reminders. And those reminders are subscribe to the uh, YouTube. Do that. Uh, and yeah, and also Patreon, patreon.com slash badhasbara. Join it. Help me pay for all of this. We have a producer now, Adam Levin, who is here and he's doing amazing work. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to trying to make sure everyone gets paid. So please do that. That'd be nice. And also, you don't need to look at us. Listen. Listen to it wherever you get your podcasts. Our faces are not important. What's important is the ads that you listen to um, you, when you listen to it on a podcast app. Those are, those are – that's what's important here because there's a lot of great ads. There's, uh, like, fertilizer. Um, there's the – I think uh, one of the episodes had just – Israeli has bar on it, which is fun. I love that because you're listening to a podcast about their propaganda and then you hear an ad for their propaganda and I get paid. So it's kind of beautiful. So please, wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe, hit the whatever notification bell exists, hit the follow button on Spotify, make comments, do the things. And finally, Join the subreddit. Uh, shout out to all the mods at r slash badhasbara. Who, we are now over 5,000. And at this point, I am convinced they do not know it is a subreddit for a podcast. Um, so if you're listening to this or watching this, uh, join it and let people know there's a podcast that is what that's why this was made. Which is, I mean, listen, it's fine if they don't know. Cool, whatever. But it'd be sick if they did. Okay, today I want to introduce, of course, my main man, the number one person in my life, other than my wife, and other than the guy I do a podcast about the wire with, uh, the number three man in my life, ladies and gentlemen, everyone else, welcome co-host Daniel Mate. I can has bara. <laughs> hey, look at that. Remember Cheeseburger? Uh, that was early days of the internet. Oh, those were great days. Those yeah. are the best. How I'm you at, doing? I'm uh, I'm on the jet lagged side of things, but I'm on the recovering side of jet lag. So yeah, I'm, you're I'm you're on right. uh, Irish. You're on Irish times right now, right? I sure am. You sure am. Yeah, you've got Ireland in your brain, and you want to go to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> had had some good crack. They're all hooked on crack over there, but it's spelled oh, C R A. No, they smoke crack. Yeah, yeah. C R A I C. That's their that? word for fun. Oh, well, that makes sense because crack is fun. Exactly. <laughs> We've yeah. all done a little bit of crack. Not us. No, no, we're sober. At least I am. I'm sober now. I actually never smoked crack. I want to put that out there for all the drugs I did do back when I used to use drugs. I never smoked crack. I like a little fresh cracked pepper. Oh, love some cracked pepper on a Caesar salad. Are you fucking kidding me, bro? Delicious. Matt. On anything. On anything. Caesar okay. salad, butternut squash soup, shrimp, cocoa, cocoa puff cereal. Cocoa Bring oh, it on. All right. The waiter comes over and says, Sir, would you like some fresh cracked pepper on your Lucky Charms? I'm saying, Bring it. Wow. Dude, I don't know what restaurant you're going to that's serving you Lucky Charms. Uh, I guess in Ireland, they probably, that's probably like three meals a day, Lucky Charms, right? That's all they eat. It really, it's, it's incredible just how much they love Irish stereotypes. There was even a rainbow. <laughs> Uh, oh. when I was there, you know? That's beautiful. Did, yeah. did you just keep pointing at it and go, guys, <laughs> pot of gold? And did, did, did they like it? Oh, they loved it. <laughs> you know, I met, oh. I met up with a uh, uh, with, uh, friend of a uh, podcast, uh, Ty Kiki. Oh, Ty Gaha. Oh, I love Ty him. Ty Gaha, yeah. He's got to come we, back. We met up in Cork and had a lot oh. of fun together. Great, great, great guy. Yeah, that guy is uh, hes one of my favorite people, and uh, I still get messages to this day from people who say um, it was very rude of me to mispronounce his name. 
Uh, and most so, of them, most of those messages are from Tig himself. They're from him, yeah. And I'm just yeah. like, get over it, Tig. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> get a normal name. You know what I'm saying? High five. Anyways, <laughs> oh, today, Daniel. We're going to talk first a little bit about what's happening in the news to get everyone caught up, and then I'm going to introduce our guest. Uh, we have a great guest today. Mm -hmm. um, but I need to talk about uh, the World Central Kitchen. So if uh, you don't know, um, which if you're listening to this podcast, I assume you follow the news. Um, so seven aid workers from uh, the World Central Kitchen have been killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Uh, the victims were British, uh, Polish, Australian, Palestinian, and also a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so that that affects everyone on this podcast. Uh, you know, you're I assume you're a dual citizen, right? No, I'm a Canadian mm. who identifies as living in America because I do. Okay. Uh, All right. I don't. I don't have citizenship. I'm on the O1 visa, which is alien of extraordinary ability. That's who you're fucking with right now. Damn, you're a super powerful alien. I well, come that, in peace. Yeah, he comes in peace. He really does. Uh, so back to sad. Uh, the WCK team was uh, traveling in a deconflicted zone in two armored cars branded with the World Central Kitchen logo. Um, and also a soft skin vehicle. Uh, the World Central Kitchen, if you don't know, is like a U.S. based nonprofit, non governmental organization that provides meals in the wake of natural disasters, and uh, actually is one of Israel's like favored NGOs. They use them a lot. Uh, and here for everyone is how the attack went down. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is how it happened. Vehicles they were in when they were killed. The World Central Kitchen logo clearly visible on the roof of this car. The group were traveling in three separate vehicles. World Central Kitchen says its workers had finished unloading tons of food at a warehouse in Deir al Bala before leaving there in three vehicles along a route and at a time which had been agreed with the IDF. The burnt out vehicles are spread out across a distance of about one and a half miles. Two of the vehicles are on the road itself. The remains of the third vehicle is here on a patch of open ground around 100 metres off the road. According to reporting by the Haaretz newspaper in Israel, survivors from the strike on the first vehicle tried to take cover in the second one, which was hit next. Then the wounded from there tried to get to the third car. The vehicles were targeted three times in succession, in other words, until everyone was killed. So... You know, the uh, Big Lebowski, you know, he's a good mm -hmm. man and thorough and thorough. Yeah. You know, well, is Israel, they're a bad country and, and thorough. thorough, quite thorough indeed. Um, so, I mean, I don't know about you, Daniel, but clearly from that video, um, it's clear that what happened to them um, was an accident. Um, you know, sometimes in war, you accidentally bomb a friendly target and then follow the survivors to another car and accidentally bomb that target and then follow the remaining survivors to another car and then accidentally bomb that target. It's rule of threes. Everyone knows this, right? Yeah, I, I heard it was a tragic mistake. Yes, yeah. Well, that's what I heard too. But uh, listen, this is something that people have been saying that this, you know, the, the Hamas media machine has been saying uh, that, you know, this is some sort of pattern, that they've seen this before. They've, you know, hurt a bunch of other uh, aid workers and whatnot. And it's like, you know, uh, yes, the killing of civilians and aid workers and doctors and foreign nationals and journalists and yada, yada, yada. I mean, it's nothing new. It's happened before. It's to be expected, Daniel, when Hamas uses human shields. All right. Like mm -hmm. what other choice does the IOF have? It says right there in the most moral army handbook that if a Hamas guy straps a baby to their chest, you're supposed to shoot through the baby. And then mm -hmm. you sh you keep shooting through any surrounding babies just to make sure that the babies are dead. It's just it it's also just says that war. if a it, yeah, it also says that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Papua New Guinea, you're supposed mm -hmm. to bomb three successive that's right. clearly marked uh aid trucks. I saw in, in the New York Times Oh, the subtlety of the New York Times, like the nuance of their Hasbara, the the 
the sort of uh, the way the Hasbara works just by the internal logic yes. and the way sentences are juxtaposed. So I saw, I, I took a screenshot of this. Um, mm -hmm. Let me find it here. Right. So here's like their little listicle about the event. Here's what we know. The mm. killings were, quote, a grave mistake, end quote. The Ooh. Israeli military chief of staff said in an, in an unusually direct acknowledgement of fault. Right. The strike prompted aid agencies to reassess their operations in Gaza. Now, what Those do are you not hear? That's not connected. Well, here's what I find <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. Number one, a grave mistake is for that to be an unusually direct acknowledgement of fault is mm -hmm. not saying much. Mm -hmm. We made a mistake. Fault, you know, generally understood would be, well, never mind. You could say it's my fault and it's a mistake. Fine. But those sure. two sentences to, next to each other are so funny. The killings yeah. were a grave mistake, they say. And the second sentence, the strike prompted aid agencies to reassess their operations in Gaza. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Accident. Yeah. It's just yeah. so, it's, it, Israel's so sad that this, that this aid agency is reevaluating aid operations that yeah. are feeding starving Palestinians. Oh, and no, I've also please, heard speculation that... The, please come back. And there's also speculation, which I don't think is implausible, that mm. at least the three Brits who have their military veterans, mm. uh, military heroes, actually, you know, it, it's absolutely plausible that they were in possession of some knowledge or having witnessed some things mm. that, uh, you know... What happens in Gaza stays in Gaza, right? Uh, it kinda, is. I mean, thing it, from Israel's point of view, I think we're gonna we're gonna learn more uh, about this as um, you know the days and weeks and months go on. Um, you know, yep. as the Israelis complete their very thorough and I'm sure trustworthy investigation. <laughs> Did um, you we'll see John Kirby's get... press conference? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just listen. I'm not in the business of. Uh, <laughs> not being cucked by Netanyahu. <laughs> um, but, you know, what makes this reaction different by Israel is that instead of telling us that, like, you know, actually Hamas did it, or actually uh, the World Central Kitchen is Hamas, or that the food exploded because, uh, you know, the, it was too spicy. Like, the Israeli Hamas government... Shook, Hamas shook up the, 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 the bottles mm -hmm. of... Of carbonated water, you know, exactly. so like like Bart on the in the April Fools episode of The Simpsons, mm -hmm. you know, and it yeah, it Hamas blew the has roof been, off the house. The, Hamas has been known to put a Mentos in Diet Coke. It's just something they do. Um, but the Israeli government, um, magnanimously, by the way, yeah. admitted that this was in fact an oopsie doopsie uh, on their part. And I have some video uh, here. First is uh, the main man himself. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu. Fresh out of surgery. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, within the last day, there was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in wartime. We're thoroughly looking into it. We're in contact with their governments, and we'll do everything to ensure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Um, and then that's not the only person who came out. Um, also, there was uh, the uh, IDF chief of staff, uh, Hertzi Hal uh, it's no, it's a uh, Halivi, um, okay. different, different, different guy, and he had this it to say: "Was a grave mistake. Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. We are sorry for the unintentional <laughs> oh, so harm sorry. to the members of WCK." You know, I don't think I've ever heard the word I've sorry the word said with sorry. said with an israeli accent <laughs> i've never heard i've that. never heard sorry sorry it was, it was like wow why does that sound so foreign to me oh because so, they don't say it so so it, so, it, it doesn't so, look quite yeah you had to practice no, that for two hours there, yeah there's no uh you know english to hebrew version of sorry uh in in uh, israel um and then of course Actually, there, yeah yeah. The, uh, you know, uh, official Israel uh, page on Twitter, um, they put out this notes app apology. Uh, whoopsie. <laughs> damn, our bad. That's just crazy out there. <laughs> and then a lot of uh, crying emojis, which means they're sad. Uh, That's and very thoughtful. 
But yeah, it's very nice of them to put out the notes app apology. Uh, and now with permission to mourn the deaths of innocent people, uh, Israel's official and unofficial spokespeople got in on the self-pity party uh, and they made a bunch of statements. We have, uh, you know, Aviva Klompas uh, saying the killing of staff from the World Central Kitchen was an absolute tragedy. Uh, we have Richie Torres here. The death of the seven World Central Kitchen volunteers is tragic. Uh, we have Barry, Barry Weiss, uh, a horrific tragedy. We have Michael Rappaport, very sad. And then, of course, <laughs> ain't it cool news? Run, don't walk to the nearest IDF safe zone. Uh, yeah. You know, they got to get in there. Got to love a As board. opposed to the nearest, uh, as opposed to what you're probably in, which is the nearest IDF kill zone. Right, yes. That's most of the zones. But there is a safe yeah. zone in there, and you just have to guess where it is. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the goat herself, Eve Fartlow, sorry, I mean Eve Suckblow, I'm sorry, I mean Steve Urkel, said... Uh, Eve, Eve, the bar is the bar is, is pretty yeah. low. <laughs> Eve, a bar is super low, said, uh, may the memory of the seven aid workers killed in Gaza uh, be for a blessing. Okay, and then... Uh, it's the first time candles. she's ever written a Palestinian name uh, yes. in memoriam. Yeah, she had yeah. to because it was... Because he died alongside six white people. That's right. And uh, that um, kind of inspired me to, you know, like, I think, like, I should also apologize for all this. Mm. So um, I I made my own apology video. Um, and I think people should watch it and just understand how sorry I am about this whole it's, thing. Today is a, it's a really tragic day for me and... For all of my liberal Zionist um, brothers and sisters out there, those aid workers at the World Kitchen who died tragically in an, in an accidental um, targeted bombing, uh, it just, it's just one of those things that is just unavoidable. And I, you know, as Zionists, I think we all need to pause for a moment and realize that, like, the collateral damage. Um, is is not good and and is in fact can be bad you know i'm I, i'm praying for them and for all their families and uh oh, got a notification israel oh they're hamas they're hamas um they deserve to die it's good that they're dead and um i'm i you know it's tragic to say but i hope their families die too uh oh Oh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> that, that was, uh, no, that was a different thing. That was a different thing. No, the, uh, this is tragic. This is tragic. The Israeli government is saying officially that this is sad. So I think it's sad that this happened um, unless they, there's something else that comes to light <laughs> later. Yeah. You, um, know what's, you know what's wild? Mm. The actual mistake they claim they made. You know what the mm -hmm. actual mistake they claim they made was? I think they said it was nighttime. No, uh, but well, no, they, well, they might they might have said that. Their claim was, we thought there was a Hamas terrorist on board the truck. Now, never mind the fact that they knew full well that there wasn't, because the person they had suspected had gotten off at a warehouse and not gotten back on. But think wow. about the logic of that. We're sorry that we killed these seven people without taking a terrorist with them. Yes. We thought yeah. we were taking a terrorist with them. Mm -hmm. It turns yeah. out we only killed them, in yeah. which case it's just not justified. Right. In which case that's, it is. That's the demonic logic of that. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, it's collateral damage, you know, and it's wartime. And sometimes we make a mistake and only kill innocent people. But if we can get one Hamas guy, even a suspect, honestly, even someone who just like wrote something on social media one time, then it's completely justified. And I'm not sorry. Then it's collaborative. Then it's collaborative damage. Right. Exactly. That is, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Um, so the question I want to ask is the same one that I think Jews have been asking for thousands of years. Uh, why is this night different from all other nights? Uh, and to answer this question, I want to bring in our guest. Um, this uh, this next guest is 
absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of my personal favorites has been reporting on uh, Israel, Palestine, Gaza for years. Independent journalist, creator of the Empire Files, and director of Gaza Fights for Freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, please welcome Abby Martin. Hey. Hey. How you doing, Abby? Hi, Abby. I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Well, considering everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a loaded <laughs> question, but we're all... <laughs> We're all doing fine, <laughs> right? You know? right. Yeah. We're do we're doing, we're doing. Right, right. We're still alive. Um, so first, Abby, I want to thank you for coming on this podcast. Uh, I've been watching Empire Files uh, for a long time, and I've really admired your work. Um, and I think you you are one of the honestly few, like rarest type of journalist, which is someone who's going to talk about uh, Israel-Palestine uh, honestly and from the ground. Um, and so, Thank I, you. yeah, well, I want to ask, um, do you condemn Hamas? <laughs> 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 you must condemn! I'm sorry. No, I... I, and, I, and, I when, I, and when when did you first, like, when did you first realize you hated Jews? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, are you sorry Answer yeah. all of those three questions immediately. <laughs> I'm sorry for October 7th. Thank I'm you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes, you personally But are you did sorry it. for the destruction of the second temple? <laughs> yeah. And will you help us build the third? <laughs> Do you have any red cows? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Abby, uh, seriously, uh, about this um, recent murder of seven aid workers. Um, I feel like um, without, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm not giving the Israeli government any credit here. I'm wondering what the uh, motivation is, uh, what the factors are that led to an actual admission of an oopsie, which is not something that they usually do immediately. It's something they usually do um, after first saying, no, Hamas did it. Or first, uh, you know, giving any kind of excuse they can to get the news cycle to stop talking about it. And then later kind of being like, yeah, I guess we killed that journalist, you know, like they did. They've done, I mean, thousands of times. Um, so do you, what are your thoughts on, on what happened here and why the Israelis are responding different this time? I think it's honestly because it's international um, and the majority of them were not Palestinian, because mm. at, at first they were trying to say it was Hamas. I mean, not the official line, but all of the sock puppets and Hasbro trolls were already like, no, if it was a strike, it wouldn't be this perfect, you know, all right. the bodies would be torn apart. Like all of that, all of the typical talking points were being put out there that it was a roadside bomb, that no, Hamas did it. And this is what you see initially to just completely deflect and obfuscate like even the truth and make it really murky. Yeah. Um, but I was frankly very surprised to see the Israeli government even care to respond and issue an apology. I mean, it must have Same. been an outpouring from the actual governments that lost citizens uh, that were pressuring them for the first time in months and months, because we see how the playbook works. You guys have detailed it extensively. It, it and, and at this point in the genocide, six months in, they simply do not care. And they have right. killed people seeking aid. This is like routine massacres that are happening every couple days of just desperate Palestinians amassing to seek aid. And they're just unleashing quadcopter drones on them, just tank shelling and, and killing people with snipers. And, the, and almost as many civilians have died trying to scavenge for food than have died on October 7th, civilians. So wow. I, I was just like, why is Israel even like caring at this point? I mean, they already said even the Hague can't stop us. They just don't care. Right. So yeah. something must have happened behind the scenes. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that they that this happened almost within 24 hours of them going and bombing an embassy? And, <laughs> yeah, that and that's pretty egregious. <laughs> and, 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 and if you had to pick and choose, like if you're going to apologize for one to almost... <laughs> offer a smoke screen for, like I'm, I'm almost imagining like the mayor's office on the wire you know like which one are we going to apologize for to deflect intention from the other right. a much more serious international incident if it's possible to imagine something more serious than killing seven inter or six mm -hmm. internationals and a palestinian delivering aid would be bombing an embassy you would think 
You would think. I mean, the only time that I saw them do this was in the initial Ali Arab hospital bombing. And I think it was right. just them reacting to the media and the governments. Um, and so they just they think they can get away with anything at this point because they can. Because they can. And so yeah. and, and so I think that this is just them being like, oh, shit, we actually just have to make a quick statement to pretend like this was a mistake. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, the fact that they just flagrantly bombed an embassy and no one's even talking about that because it was just over. I mean, maybe that's their playbook now. It should just commit, like, like stack the war crimes and compound right. them all per day so then they can only just address one and then 24-hour news cycle will just forget about the rest. It, it's happening at such a, a ridiculous rate that it's really it, – it's staggering and it's hard to wrap your mind around. 100%. For the one that makes you look the most human mm -hmm. and ignore the other one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. The the one that makes you look the most magnanimous because you can't you can't yeah. justify an embassy bombing as I mean that's nothing other than terrorism that is that is what that is that is the tactic I mean that the world's most contrite army yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah no so I I do think that you know what I have seen coupled with this like magnanimous admission of a mistake has been. Let's see Hamas try to do that, um, which is I think it's just so disingenuous. And it's so I think at least on the part of the mouthpieces, the Israeli has Boris and whatnot. It is clearly what they want people to get out of this, which is that when Israel does make a mistake, they own up to it and they do an investigation. Now, Hamas, Hamas commit a massive massacre and apologize challenge. Go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, listen, it's actually harder for them than it usually is, <laughs> you know what I mean, for anyone else. They do not like to apologize. So do you think, um, just based on kind of your, uh, I mean, history of studying this subject and like looking into this, um, the video that I played earlier of uh, the, what was it? It was the IDF's like um, chief of staff, uh, Hertzi uh, Halivi. Do you find the apologies itself to be, um, they feel coerced to me, I guess is the question. And do <laughs> it's you like th he's being held hostage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally, if you, if you watched that video again, is this not... <laughs> Is this not a hostage video? This is the most <laughs> hostage ass video I've ever seen. Just like. And was a grave mistake. <laughs> Israel is at a war with Hamas, not with the people of Gaza. We are sorry. I mean, so we, we are, we are so so we. Well, I like how I like how he has to then articulate the point like, no, 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 no. We're not at war with the civilians. We're just at war with Hamas. It's like. Yeah. Dude, what are you talking yeah, about? You guys yeah, just I killed mean, everything but Hamas. Right, exactly. I mean, at this point, it's it's uh, so disingenuous to continue this lie of like we're we're trying to kill Hamas when a a anyone who has lived through the war on terror era of the United States and the world what knows that you don't kill an ideology, you just create you end up creating uh, more and more people who are going to be uh, like, who's going to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to be pro-Israel now, now that you've killed my entire family. Right. Yeah, it's like everyone in Gaza does not join the Hamas that has suffered at the hands of Israel, but everyone in Hamas yeah. has suffered at the hands of Israel. Like, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not inevitability that you're going to join a resistance group, but like no. all the people in Hamas certainly have suffered yes. and have lost things. And so it's not really hard to make you know, the logical conclusion that this will further radicalize people. And what is going to like, I just keep wondering, like 19,000 orphans, you yeah. know, all all of the amputees, like what what is going to happen to this generation that's growing up? I mean, not to mention just millions of people who are traumatized. Yes. I, like, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know what my whole it, fucking it, family. It, yeah, I'm probably yeah. going to want to kill you. In Israel's mind, I think that generation will grow up to be uh you know, Lithuania and Bulgaria and uh, Montenegro's most traumatized uh, minorities. Yeah, you yeah, know, right. Once we get once we get the peer built. Yeah, oh and my God, and, and it just it just seems to be uh, so counterintuitive to anyone with a working brain that you you know you wonder why they would hold on to this complete 
lie that like no 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 we're just trying to we're just trying to get rid of Hamas when you when it is just so I, th so I think clear. that they they just need to placate the American public because we're the ones who sponsor yeah. and subsidize their apartheid and, and their entire regime um, with weapons. I don't know why necessarily because they are such a huge arms dealer. But beside the point, like they they unleash all of these spokespeople who speak English. This is all designed for an American audience. So yes. what we just saw, the spokesperson who's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're <laughs> at war with the Mars. Yeah. Uh, and then Netanyahu looking like a wax fucking figure. I, I don't know what the hell Perma just... Uh, yeah, did he have the surgery that like sucked the... Um, <laughs> yeah, the buccal fat, fat surgery. Yeah, like did yeah. he? I mean, what the hell is going on with that guy? Yeah, but I mean, that, he, was, that, he's... he was going for the Anna uh, Taylor Joy <laughs> yeah, look. Yeah, right. <laughs> Failed miserably. <laughs> he um, wants to look like the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> yeah. Instead, yeah, that he just, just looks... cost a, a million U.S. taxpayer dollars to be right. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like that, that's for us. And so mm. for Israeli society, I mean, I remember when they when when we were being told by Biden and all of these assholes here that, no, we can't trust the Hamas run health ministry. We need to right. question all these numbers. At the same time, in Israeli society, their local news was running the same counter that the Hamas run health ministry was running for civilian casualties and saying, mm. these are how many terrorists we've killed. Right. Like it right. is unabashed and admitted. Yeah. And so it's just posturing and very, very infantilizing to have Israeli officials literally coming over to the U.S. and telling us these things because that's all that the U.S. really wants from them. Just come over here, apologize, just say what we need to hear, say that there's a peace process in the works, say that you want a two-state solution and everything else is washed away. And at least we can point to that statement and just say, no, 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 it was an accident and yeah. case closed. And that's what they do every single time. And it's absolutely despicable because we all know the truth. We can see with our own eyes and we know what the Israeli society is saying. Yeah. And it couldn't be further from what we're hearing here. Yeah, it's definitely not, I'm sorry. Uh, right. <laughs> that is Abby, not... I have a, qu a yeah. quick question for you. You're, you're talking about, or maybe it's not a quick, maybe it's a quick question, but not a quick answer. I'm just mm. curious. You're, you're talking about, you know, the American public, the American audience. Um, we had Chuck Schumer's speech recently, which was in some ways the most surprising speech from... A U.S. senator that I can remember in terms of where he went with it. This is the most stalwart defender of Israel who gave a rather even-handed um, and sober um, assessment of blame on both sides. Not only that, but he was speaking about the one-state solution and kind of giving it its due in terms of young people. Uh, he sort of understands why it's appealing to young people. He didn't dismiss it angrily as... Uh, as out of hand anti-Semitic, he just argued against it. It was quite something. And I'm wondering, I, I was watching Max Blumenthal along with my brother on the Gray Zone stream yesterday, and there was sort of a, a, a sense that Max was pushing that like, we might be approaching the day when the US protective umbrella gets removed, that Israel is spinning so far out of control now that even that, that the support might be starting to crumble and that the, the spin in the Hasbara might be working less and less and, and the spell might be rubbing off. Do you have that sense at all that, that we might be entering a, a phase of uh, where, where things start to shift? I do. And I think looking at several factors here, I mean, the first factor, first and foremost, is the fact that Biden is running this policy. He is single-handedly overseeing the worst, most heinous war crimes in, in the modern era. And that's because this is validated by even senior officials that have resigned in protest over the genocide, saying the buck stops with him. No mm -hmm. matter how much pressure is surrounding him, no matter how many advisors are dissenting with this policy, he is the one who is doing it. I mean, of course, you know, everyone's Zionist, really, but Biden is one of the worst. I mean, he was on the House yeah. floor a couple decades ago, and even Medjim Begin was just like, who is this guy? He's literally justifying using like women and children as cannon fodder. Um, yeah, I, Menachem Begin really had surreal. to say to him, sir, we, sir, we do not do that, but <laughs> right, we, no, we was... don't kill women and children. This is at the time when <laughs> Reagan was saying, yeah, yeah, not stop yet. your Holocaust <laughs> in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so I think that says it all, that Biden has always been one of the worst, most unapologetic Zionists. He was on the House floor also saying, you know, if Israel didn't exist, we need to create her for our own interests. So he, mm -hmm. you know, with these secret arm transfers, over 100 deals that bypassed Congress over the last six months, I think it really speaks volumes about him leading the charge on this. So if it weren't for him, 
who knows what we would be seeing in terms of pressure actually reaching the presidential office. Um, I think the pressure is mounting. It's working. That's why we see someone like Chuck Schumer even being able to speak these truths for the first time, addressing critically um, the ridiculousness of this of this unbreakable bond. Uh, the fact that there was an abstention at the UN Security Council for the first time ever, that there was yeah, actually right. applause. You have not seen that in decades of just exasperation from world bodies just saying, fuck, thank you, finally. Finally, I mean, the U.S. has been the one who is shrouding Israel with impunity for the last 50 years. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like every time that there that there's tr an attempt for international accountability, the U.S. Uh, vetoes it. So I think that this was a hugely significant moment. Of course, they backpedaled and was like, no, it's not binding. No, it's because we didn't condemn Hamas. But I think it was internal pressure that finally wore down some of these people that said, um, no, we're we're look, Israel is going too far and they're dragging us along down with them. I mean, for the longest time, I kept asking, what will it take? What will it take? Because the U.S. cares too much about its public image to to do the things that Israel is doing. I think every country yeah. in the world other than Israel, because it has the backing of the U.S. empire, would care too much about its image to target it, you know, assassination of 100 plus journalists, I mean, not all of them in targeted assassinations, but killing that many journalists, killing that many aid workers, desecrating the entire Gaza Strip, the medical infrastructure, all of these war crimes, it is too much. And it makes what the U.S. has done in places like Iraq. I mean, it really pales in comparison to the frequency of what Israel is doing um, and how blatant it all is. So I think that I was asking that same question, what will it take for the U.S. to stop protecting Israel to this extent because of how much it's hurting U.S. hegemony. It seems so counterintuitive to global capitalism, and it seems counterintuitive to Biden's reelection chances. But I think that we're finally seeing the answer to that, that the pressure is mounting. It's not working anymore. And I think the U.S., you know, when you're an empire, every problem is a nail. Right. And so whether it's sanctions in Latin America and you losing your grip on hegemony in that region or just this this unshakable bond with israel this allegiance that will drag you down and lose your standing in the rest of the world um but i think maybe maybe some clear heads are coming out top uh, uh, in our administration and they're finally saying look this is this is hurting us too much it's yeah, finally becoming don't... too untenable for us and i hope that that's the case and maybe it's because they just don't like being chased down and hounded by people yeah. everywhere they go. Maybe they're just like, shit, I can't even leave my house. Yeah, it's which beautiful. is yeah, it's, it is wonderful to watch. And, uh, you know, I, I, I it just what shocks me about it is um, <clears throat> it even ended this, Lizzo's career. I know Lizzo, <laughs> Lizzo quit. We lost her. <laughs> yeah, Lizzo was like performed at the uh, what was it radio city music hall at a special a special uh biden obama like you know genocide's okay if you're if you're sad about it event and yeah. um uh and yeah yeah she performed and people dragged, dragged her and you know, yeah people put the what zone of the... interest music oh, over God. what was with the whole cast of like arrested development there i was like what am i What's going on? I miss that. That I, you know what? I'm I'm gonna pretend I didn't hear that. <laughs> I love that show so much. It's oh. horrible. Everyone <sighs> is so horrible. Everyone's disappointing me at all at all times. Stephen um, fucking Colbert. Oh my god. Ugh. Well, remember With remember when he shaved his head, um, and was doing the whole campaign slot for Obama and shaved his head, basically saying like I'm gonna become a marine and and did that whole uh, USO tour yeah. agit propaganda god yeah yeah you know it's uh it's not even like don't ever meet your heroes it's uh don't don't follow your heroes and hope that they they die at some point so you don't have to see them <laughs> turn into what they become uh but uh you know i it, what's shocking to me about this too is like for anyone who's been paying attention um if we're just talking like electoral politics reasons for why this is bad uh, like anyone who knew anything about this knew this was going to be bad electorally like i i, I it, what it, it surprises me that they're even a little bit having some sort of like come to Jesus moment um, because of the fact that like there was, you know, everyone knows that no matter what Biden does for Israel, he's still going to be, you know, uh, 
he's still going to be going up against Trump, who is beloved by, you know, uh, Netanyahu and, you know, is he he will still get dragged by the right wing Republican uh, Israel affiliated, you know, uh, mouthpieces and lobbyists and whatnot. And not to mention the fact that people do actually give a shit that he is committing a genocide. Like, it it just shocks me that people are like, wow, man, I don't think people like this. And (laughs) And Trump is saying, wrap it up, guys. Yeah, right. At this point. Trump is saying, you got to wrap it up. Now, he's not saying wrap it up because Palestinian lives matter, but that's not how Trump rolls. No, of course not. This looks bad. This is, you know, you got to, you're being inefficient. Wrap it up. But he's making more sense than Biden is. When Trump cares more about optics than anyone <laughs> than like than Biden, you know that shit is going insane in the Democrat White House. You know what I mean? Like he is never given a shit of about optics. He will literally just do whatever the fuck he wants, even if you're like, that looks exactly like a crime. And he's like, shut up, you're a crime. And and at this point, it's just clear to me that uh Biden is not only doesn't care about optics, but he might even think the optics are good for him in some way. I, I'm not really sure what he's thinking. Yeah, he must Here's be an off so the cuff insulated. theory. Yeah. Yeah, he must be. Now, here, let me float this theory. What, tell me what you guys think. Yeah. The Democrats are so used to taking black voters for granted. Yes. And they've had ample reinforcement for that position, mm-hmm. you know, because you've got Clyburns in the mix. Right. Who will exactly. always go out and rally the base and the black, mm-hmm. the black community in America has their own reasons for just gravitating back to the Democrats no matter what. Right. That they may not have taken seriously that Arab Americans, to say nothing of young people in general, when it comes to, you know, how strongly people feel about Palestine and 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 the absolute red line that this is and the fact that there are certain groups that you can't take and that you can't take for granted right oh get over it it's like what hillary clinton said just get over it there's two choices my way or the highway or whatever the fuck she said and jimmy fallon's like yeah yeah i like that yeah Yeah, he's like uh slapping his knee Uh (laughs) chortling (laughs) yeah Yeah. good one god damn what Um, a hog I mean, uh, you're right. I think, yeah. like, look, the Democratic Party is essentially just one thing and one thing only. It's a massive voter turnout machine. That's right. all they care about. That's all they ramp up for every two years. Their entire rhetoric is just progressive. It's just the veneer of progressivism, but it's really right wing policies. And then they wonder, why don't people vote for us? And then they blame the left. They blame the non voters. They blame mm-hmm. everyone except themselves. And there's no accountability. But I think that this time around, there is a fear now that they're seeing the uncommitted voters tally very, very high in swing states. And already Biden was dragging his feet. He was already losing almost every swing state before facilitating an overseeing genocide. Yeah. So if that's not waking people up in the Democratic Party apparatus, I don't know what will. But you're right. I think Arab voters, Palestinian voters and just people of fucking conscience, yeah. young people, because young people, even though the Democrats lost the midterms. Apparently, they painted that as a victory because they didn't lose as much as they thought they were. Right. And it was really the young people coming out in droves, rejecting the right wing um, judges who overturned Roe v. Wade. Right. But I think that those people are not going to show up this time. And even when they were polled and like asked when they were in the polling lines, and stuff, they were just like, I blame the Democrats and I, I'm just so mad. I, I hate Biden and I hate them for doing this and not stopping this. But like, I'm still more mad at the right wing and so that they were still very crystal clear about like why they were voting against like the lesser of two evil at that point but i don't i don't think it's going to work this time because there is no lesser of two evils in this situation yeah come to think of it yeah go ahead man no i mean you make i think a perfect point here which is like in order to be like you got to vote for the lesser of two evils you have to be less evil you can't (laughs) like that is like the whole thing you can't, you can't be it's not the nicer of two evils right <laughs> yeah you can't actually be in fact more evil <laughs> that's right that's like the number one rule of being lesser of two evils and yeah and even though trump would probably be doing the same thing and i'm mm-hmm. sure he oh would sure be, you sure. know it, he's not doing it right now right exactly and it just kind of leads you to 
the point, like, if they are still viewing themselves with the strategy of, well, we are the lesser of two evils, it just reinforces the fact that they look at what's going on in Gaza and say, well, genocide is less evil than Trump, you know, yes. uh, doing the Capitol riot on January 6th. Yeah, because Trump, Trump is yeah. Hitler. Right, exactly. And, and dude, Biden is so, oh my God, he's such a nightmare. Remember during the, the, I don't even know if it was 2016 or 2020, but when when Biden was harangued by his by his base or by young people or whatever, like about immigration and all these right. policies that were very right wing, he was just like, just vote for Trump. If you don't right. like me, vote yes. for yeah. Trump. And that's his attitude now. I remember a Muslim came up to him or an imam or someone was asking him about the genocide and he was just like, Trump will deport you. Yeah. So vote for Trump if that's what you want. It's just like, what? If you don't vote for me, you ain't Arab. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh God. And here's some hot sauce to prove it. Yeah. Here's some Zatar, it, you know? a packet of Zatar in my <laughs> <Yeah>. bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it is. You know, uh, uh, yeah. The Democrats' approach to losing the midterms is very reminiscent of Israel's approach to the ICJ ruling. We won, guys. Yeah, right. Yeah, actually, <laughs> we won very much. We're so. not. We're not in. We're, we're not in jail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, here's uh, uh here's UNRWA that we need to defund, uh, and let's change the subject. Yeah, um, it is. You know, the, the electoral politics thing for me has been the most. I think, um, just annoying facet of the conversation and the discourse because you just come to a point where you just go uh, if i can't trust you to act within the realms of not just like humanity but like even like cold calculated logic uh <laughs> you know even just regular ass like conniving machiavellian i want to win an election you know fucking tommy carchetti from the wire <laughs> type thing this two of the wire references now like if i can't trust you to at least be that self-interested then I really don't know on what human level to engage with you. So I don't like my whole thing with the electoral politics thing has been like, I don't, I don't, I don't fucking know. No one's acting normal. Um, but just on like the genocide level, I think that is something that I, I want to talk with you more about Abby, the, the human costs and kind of like the, um, the way in which the conversation around what's been happening in Gaza has been co-opted, I think, by, uh, you know, Hezbaras who want to argue the intricacies of, well, what is mm -hmm. a, a genocide? Mm -hmm. um, and you see this all the time uh, with, you know, these like Israeli spokespeople and their like, you know, uh, Western counterparts Matt, in the UK. Matt, we could commit genocide if we wanted to. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite, my favorite thing ever that someone says. Is Benny we, Morris said that. Yes, they Ooh. all say to, it. To Finkelstein's face, he said, eh, if they wanted to commit, we could kill 500,000 if we wanted yeah. to. Yeah. It's a but, very and, strange and argument. I, yeah. I mean, the argument itself is basically, you know, it's like it, the attempt there is to say, listen, if we wanted to do genocide, like we're re we'd be really good at it. But all it's <laughs> all it comes off sounding like is like, listen, if you guys wouldn't be such assholes about it, we would do an actual genocide. But we're trying to do this in a way that's nice. If we're trying to do it kids. slowly. Well, it's like, yeah, it's like an abuser who has a gun yes. to your head. And he's like, you want to stop the kids from dying? Yes, yeah. exactly. Then just release the hostages. <laughs> We can commit genocide if we wanted to. Right now. You hear that? It's just like, um, what? Yeah. Your 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 camera froze for just a second when <laughs> you did the wide eyes and I was like, this is amazing. It's a Don't fantastic use that as a screenshot. screenshot. <laughs> no, no, no. It's perfect. It was so good. Um but yeah, uh, you know, this this argument has been put forth. I mean, you talk about the Finkelstein, Benny Morris debate, you know, uh, Destiny, who is uh, density. some. Yeah, Density. Destiny. Oh, some, density. Some, some uh, he's like a, what's, what has been called a, a debate pervert. Um, is His main argument has been um, trying to parse the legal definition of what is and isn't a genocide. Uh, you know, he's just like, no, this is a very specific term. And I read about it on Wikipedia and it's very important <laughs> to me. And, uh, and so his whole thing is to deny, 
uh, the idea of a genocide based on the fact that uh, it has some sort of, you know, uh, it has a legalistic type of definition that doesn't quite match. It's only only three of the five boxes of genocide. But you don't need checked. five of the five. And also, it, right. it's so funny. It's like, not only is it just totally mm-hmm. explicitly clear when you look at the actual UN charter for the mm-hmm. prevention of genocide, um, it couldn't be more clear. Yeah. Like I to mean, match exactly what Israel's doing. But even, yes. even okay, let's put that aside for one second. Just mm-hmm. the fact that we're even having the debate, I think is just yes, so exactly. funny. It, it exposes that what Israel is doing is pretty goddamn egregious that we're yeah. even having the debate. Does yes. this classify as genocide or not? And that should warrant yeah. a ceasefire immediately and to stop Israel from the mass killing. Yeah. It's like, well, because, should never exactly, again, because, like okay, we should stop let's say, it before it becomes full-blown genocide, shouldn't right, we? Exactly. Right. <laughs> let's say it's not a genocide, okay? Let's say it's not a genocide. It's not at the genocide rung of the ladder. Right. Well, what are the two or three rungs right. close right to the below. genocide rung? It's right. one of those things. There's right. only right. two. There's right. genocide, <laughs> and it's okay to kill all those right. guys. Right. That's that, the binary. <laughs> and that, that it's like such a ridiculous argument, even just on its face. And I mean, this is what Hasbroists do. This is what they're experts in. Yes. It's like they lost the moral argument. They lost the high ground so long ago. And they've had us on the defense for decades. Like, yeah. it's anti-Semitic. Everything is anti-Semitic. And so for naturally for anti-bigots and anti-racists who care about the plight of Jewish people and who care about the rise of anti-Semitism, we were always like, no, 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 it's not anti-Semitic because, but now it's like these assholes are now on the defense. Now they have to defend genocide, apartheid, ethnic cleansing and mass murder. So that's great. But they've somehow managed to divert into now muddying the waters about genocide. I mean, that's yes. why it's so amazing, finally, yeah. that uh, players on the world stage have brought it. You know, right. Ireland is now intervening, that the yes. ICJ ruling is happening, because it's like, finally, we don't have to be making this case anymore. Right, The 100%. International Court of Justice is. That was entirely, I think that was the thing that a lot of people, um, you know, who've been... Uh, who care about this issue and have cared about it for a long time were, were celebrating when South Africa had uh, the balls to do this, to actually, uh, you know, put a, a case of genocide against Israel because it was like something in the institutional, you know, world, something that is, uh, uh, you know, that has a logo and has people in suits that go to a building, like- With wigs. With wigs and shit. <laughs> like something official said what we have all been seeing with our own eyes uh, for months. And, uh, and uh, by the way, I think the scale is, there's two, it's a binary. There's genocide and there's let it slide. And if it's <laughs> anything below- <laughs> Below genocide is let it slide. That's how it goes. Um, but yeah, you know, you you brought up the uh, Hasbarists, um, uh, and you recently, uh, Abby, were on uh, the, the Pierce Morgan's show, um, whatever it's called, Pierce Pierce Tonight, um, Piercing Your Heart, whatever it's called, uh, and uh, he had Pierce Morgan on... disinterested. Yeah, is that what it's called? <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Pierce Morgan. I don't know. Um, and uh, he what about had this pedantic on, point? Yeah. Um, let's see. So he had on a uh, one of my favorite uh, Twitter has barists, um, uh, a woman by the name of Emily Schrader, who uh, his. If you don't know Emily Schrader, Emily Schrader is a. Uh, uh, is a Hezbarist, uh, it works for uh, Israeli Hezbar orgs like Stand With Us uh, was one of the orgs she worked for and uh, is uh, the director of social media or was the director of social media for Stand With Us. So this is something she's done for a while. Uh, an international uh, Israel education uh, organization in Jerusalem is how they call it. That's not what it is. Um, and is from Los Angeles, made Aliyah in 2015, and uh, I listened to a podcast with her recently in which she explained her how she went from being just a LA girl to a you know genocidal lady um, or woman, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and uh, it LA was literally woman part two. Yes, LA Woman Part Two. <laughs> this is in which Jim Morrison just talks about <laughs> Hasbara. Um, she was a student at USC. And uh, she was uh, around during um, apartheid week. 
and she said she was so annoyed by the protests that she's they like, that annoyed- sounds good apartheid yeah. where's that yeah. oh where's that going yeah, apart- on i thought i thought they were, Sign me up. i thought that i thought they phased that out i can get apartheid some of that week oh i love apartheid week it's my favorite where is this happening it. again oh, it's yeah, like a career right. it's like it's like career fair you know it's like career it's like career week it's like you find a career apartheid week you find an apartheid state you want to live in uh and yeah so basically she became a hisbaris out of spite um, and uh, you were on Pierce with her, and I just uh, wanted to, to play some moments that I thought were great. Um, you uh, were asked uh, f- <laughs> by Pierce about, um, you know, your thoughts on whether or not it was a genocide, and uh, I thought you had a, a great answer, so I'm going to play some of that for you. Awesome. I believe that what's happened in Gaza constitutes genocide. I do. And I think that the fact that this debate is raging on shows that what Israel is doing is egregious enough. The fact that people are (laughs) actually having a debate on whether or not it is genocide. Like you said, the International Court of Justice has agreed that there's a plausible case for genocide. I think that you just clearly articulated several factors that Israel is, in fact, carrying out. The mental bodily harm and carrying about conditions uh, to destroy a group of people. Clearly, the complete siege on Gaza, the elimination or the prevention, rather, of water, food, electricity, the prevention of aid, um, widespread preventable illnesses, uh, killing people. Now uh, we see two million people on the brink of starvation. Clearly, these are all intended to destroy a group of people. When you compound that with the indiscriminate bombing in the most densely populated places on Earth, I would absolutely (laughs) constitute that that as genocidal (laughs) killing. And then peers compound that with the fact that there's genocidal intent. I, I'm watching, sorry, uh, your yes. answer is so good, Abby, but she has this unfair advantage yeah. that yeah, she, her know. facial expressions You are can't just, help but look at her. They're fascinating to watch. Yeah. It's a kind of kabuki, like, like, <laughs> <It is>. like, <laughs> like <laughs> Japanese kabuki math. smirking, yes. you know? Well, yes. Pierce even has to ask her at a certain point, like, why are you laughing when we're talking about dead kids? Like, yeah. quite it, literally, he's just like, "You is this... A joke? Is this a joke to you? Yeah, which is, I mean, listen, this is the this is the thing with Zionism and Zionists in general. Is uh, you know, I've said before, they absolutely have an inverted view of reality. Like we laugh at this in order not to cry because it is so right. horrific. Uh, but Zionists believe they are the victims, and so they don't know what they look like when they are laughing at the fact that their own country. Uh, or the country they support is murdering children. Uh, again, yeah. Gallo's humor uh, is <laughs> not the same thing. Not my is- type of humor. Well, Israelis think Gallo's humor is when the hangman makes a joke. That is right. the the way that they interpret it. They don't they don't un- fully understand them as the oppressor. Uh, anyway, themselves. folks, we want to bring up our next uh, <laughs> our, our next victim. Our next Israeli stand-up comedian. <laughs> I just flew into Gaza, and boy, are all those kids I killed tired. Oh, God. What, what, why aren't you laughing? <laughs> I'm the good guy. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so then um, uh, Emily uh, responds uh, to that and um, with just – it's it's amazing to me because her response to is Israel committing a genocide um, is so her denial is so genocidal in nature that I I can't compute why she doesn't see herself you know like like how does she view herself but I'll I'll play it for you guys so you can understand how insane it truly is Of course not all Palestinians are human animals and Palestinian civilians. There are many innocent people. However, as President Herzog said, it is also true that there is a certain degree of complicity with many of the people of Gaza. Now, does that mean that they deserve to die, as she stated? No, of course not. But it's not the same thing as being innocent either. Whoa! And then, and then, and then the the face the face she returns to after making her mic drop face. I know. Literally, I'm sorry. I don't like to be the guy. I know I'm going to get comments about this about body shaming, but she looks like a shaved Grinch. Like yeah. she's got, she's got, you know, like the whole thing is very Doctor Susie. The mouth, I'm the sorry. mouth shape is. She got a triangular sort of mouth situation. 
And yes. those Susie eyes, yeah. I, I mean, just the... Uh, and it doesn't the, mean they're entirely yeah. innocent either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Um, <laughs> And uh, what I love is Piers Morgan like listens to the sentence she just said and computes it and processes it immediately and goes, "Wait, what?" And this is this is the rest of that clip. There are no innocent oh people God. in the Palestinian side. I don't think that that's true. That there's no innocent people. Isn't that what I think you just that to be said? I think that there is a certain degree of complicity. <laughs> Literally, with many what she said. of the population, as we see in in the polls, according to their polls, the Palestinian conducted How many? Poll, How many? Over 70% of the people in Gaza support the actions of October 7th. I wish it wasn't the case. But Emily, you're but just that using the reality that. On you're the just ground. using that poll. You're using that poll to paint all civilians as guilty. Do you I realize am, that? I when am you absolutely do that, you're not. I literally stated the opposite. Yes, you I are. said 70%. You're saying that because. <laughs> I'm sorry. I literally stated the opposite. <laughs> Merely 70% need to die. <laughs> Well, because again, there's only it's a binary. It's either all yep. or yeah, not yeah. all. Genocide yep. or let it slide. It's either all or fall. Uh, here we go. Has I Palestin said seventy percent. Emily, of course there are innocent Palestinians. So what does that mean? But what, many you're, you're rationalizing collective punishment and starvation of two million people, one million kids. That's what you're rationalizing by saying Abby, that seventy percent over with the seventeen thousand. So seventy percent of people uh, in Palestine are of this view. 50% of that population are under 18. They're, they're children. So are you including large numbers of children in your assessment that Palestinians all, all believe this way? I don't believe that the statistics of that poll, how they conducted it, included children. However, I don't know. So I would have to investigate that if It didn't further. include children, then that doesn't include half the people in Gaza. That yeah. And, uh, I mean, just... She goes on at one point to uh, talk about how um, the children in Gaza are being abused by right. Hamas. Right. And uh, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to play a little bit of that because th this to me is just 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 we'll play it. <laughs> Seventy percent of the people in Gaza have a view would have to include a lot of children. Right, and if you don't include the children, you don't include half the population. Well, then you're talking about a narrow number of people. Comparative. Sure, but you also have to consider the fact that Hamas is actively recruiting and indoctrinating youth with this very extremist jihadist ideology, and it's child abuse. It's an unfortunate reality that Palestinian children are dealing with. So that leads me to my next question for you, Abby. Um, isn't it? justified isn't it right um to in that in order to stop child abuse you have to kill children you'll be reduced you'll well, be course. greatly reducing the number of abused children in the world that's what we want right to of course right yeah exactly it's, you have to kill i mean i think that's a pr yeah. perfectly cromulent question and i don't see why anyone <laughs> would have a problem with it um no just like that point of calling children um like like framing them as as child abuse victims uh from from the, uh, at the hands of hamas as a justification for the indiscriminate murder of children by the hands of israel is like it's so detached from reality that like you know there are times when i you know i uh, I try not to look um, at my own personal history, you know, like growing up in West Los Angeles and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, growing up with uh, a lot of Zionists, with a lot of Israelis, too, uh, you know, and meeting all different kinds and knowing that, like, it's just it's a it's a spectrum of beliefs that everyone has, especially in the United States. You, you're not really getting the raw shit. But I look at that and I just go, like, what is the thinking in Israeli society that allows this kind of messaging to go completely um, just unchecked or like un well, know, yeah, it's it's at. it's less explained by just a total fucking settler like her. I mean, someone who just lives in Los Angeles and moves to Israel. I understand the cradle to grave indoctrination. I truly do. Yeah, the forced separation, the apartheid that's actually used against Israelis as well, that they can't go into the West Bank. They can't go to Gaza. They never interact with Palestinian kids. But for someone like Emily, who just leaves L.A. in her yeah. mid 20s and just makes Aliyah and is just living in a fanatical fascist state and, and becomes a propagandist for them. 
it, it takes a level of depravity and sociopathy that I can't wrap my mind around at all. I yeah. mean, I, I saw her conduct an interview with one of these Israeli spokespeople for, of course, Western audiences to consume. And the whole thing was just saying how the death toll is fake, how we can't trust the numbers and how the vast majority are not children. They're actually Hamas militants. And it was just it was just the most disgusting genocide denial I've ever seen to, to yeah. do that for your job. Yeah. It's truly sick. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and it and it like blows my mind because, you know, I, you know, Emily is such a interesting or not interesting, but I'm I'm fascinated by her as a has barista because <laughs> she's so recognizable as people that I grew up with. Like I'm literally also uh, I'm an L.A. boy born and raised uh like i i had to like try to i was like trying to look up like what high school she go to and i wanted to know and you know when i saw she went to usc i was like oh, okay so she went to a private school probably but um uh you know i just like you know i i look at that kind of soul destroying job and part of me goes like i think your soul needs to be destroyed before you enter this kind of work like it, it, it just yeah. the, it just yeah it blows my you're mind you're a true I'm... believer i mean you're a true believer none of these people i mean there certainly there's people who are paid to lie and they know that it's not anti-semitic i think that's like that's the main thing that they yeah. know that they're lying about but other than that i truly think people like emily believe they believe in the rhetoric it's just like you know, like Marco Rubio being asked by the Parkland kid, like, why do you get money from the NRA? They pay you to do this and that. And he's like, no, they buy into my agenda. <laughs> this is what I believe. Like, yeah. I get money from them yeah. because I believe this. And so I think that, yeah. you know, when you're looking at corporate media stooges or agents for empire, they, they're true believers in the system and they are all Zionists and they believe in U.S. hegemony and U.S. imperialism. So it's hard to, like, unpack that. And yeah, they're soulless and they just want to ascend in their careers and they want the access. But someone like Emily, you can tell she literally thinks what she's saying. Yeah. For the most I mean, part. And, not and that's arm, what's so not, scary. Yeah, that is what's Not scary. to armchair psychoanalyze, but there's something deeply please, damaged there. Please, please like, do. There's, this is my please. favorite thing you do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. We're all here for it. I mean, yes. you have to be deeply damaged in the part of you that feels things. Yes. You have to. Something happened in L.A whether it was earlier in her life or more recently, that that a, a place where she can go and be on top and join the powerful and not give a shit and be a part of a winner. There's something yeah. there that's filling a deep emotional need for these people. Same thing like R Richie Torres, these 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 yeah. true believers. There's Israel is um is is a project it's an external projection of some internal um drive that that uh that that which makes it impossible for these people to wake up out of it because they need it too much to keep their sense of identity together i want to ask right. you something though if i mm -hmm. could just slightly change topics Please. about the pay the paid ones who don't necessarily believe it because mm -hmm. i'm not sure which ones disgust me more as tom petty said i can't decide which is worse right the richie mm -hmm. torres is the uh the emily schraders or this triumvirate of White House and State Department spokespeople right now. I'm wondering if you've ever seen anything quite like Matthew Miller, John <laughs> Kirby, and Corinne Jean-Pierre. I mean, and I'm I'm remembering Jen Psaki. I'm remembering mm -hmm. the you know, mm -hmm. Kellyanne Conway. Yep. I'm remembering whoever the fuck used to go out during Sean the Spicer. Bush administration. Yeah. Sean Spicer. I have never in my life seen, and I can't quite put my finger on what it is about these people. Uh, but you know, Kirby's exchange the other day with the journalist asking him about the world kitchens, uh, the world kitchen bombing and saying, you know, and furthermore, sir, I'll have, you know, that the Israelis have not found any evidence whatsoever in the state department. It, am I right that there's just something that these are no, new, there's something, new there's, depths we've yeah. never seen before? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, Ari Fleischer, right? He was the press secretary. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was pretty fucking bad. But yeah, yeah. all the all the ink that was spilled for Sean Spicer and, or Spicer during yeah. the Trump administration and, and Sarah Huckabee Sanders and how aghast everyone was that she can go and run Trump's cover for all the lies. Mm -hmm. And what about this? I mean, what's especially 
disgusting about someone like John Kirby is that he actually cried yes. talking about Ukraine. Yeah. Yes. Cried. Yes. So yeah. for that, I mean, for me, I I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm very like expressive about my emotions. I it, it seems so particularly deranged and pathological yeah. to actually cry crocodile tears for like some foreign policy objective and then just to be completely stoic and and unaffected when you see six months of children blown to bits. I know that they're seeing them. Yes, they have. They're to. seeing the pictures. So yeah. what what kind of like levels of human psychology does that speak to where you're you're that deep seated in your commitment that you can actually put on a show like that? Yeah. And Aaron pointed out that Karine Jean Pierre can't even look up when she's speaking. Like she's right. now she's, at the point where yeah. and, and and but she just does it. There's just a kind of like fuck it, tough it out. You yeah. know, keep the tough job. it out. You're gonna get it. You're get, gonna get a book deal. You're gonna get, you're your gonna get deal. exactly. Yep. You're, you're gonna be on MSNBC. Yep. You're just, gonna be a commentator. You know, we're, we're just ride it. it out. Ride it yeah. out. People yeah. are gonna forget. People are gonna forget. And you and you can feel the. It's the same kind of like optics calculus that a Sean Spicer, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders was doing. Like uh, once I'm once I eventually get fired or I'm out of this job. I'm going to write a book and then I'm going to correct, you know, the history. The difference is, is they're doing that for a genocide. They're yeah. doing it for Sarah something Huckabee that Sanders. is not, it's not about like some fucking, you know, like uh, meeting that Protecting Trump your... had with a Russian yeah. guy. It's like, this is about a, literally a genocide. If you believe um, in or your boss. Or at least boss, one below, you... a let it slide, you know, yeah. but like, that's <laughs> insane to me. If you're ride or die for your boss, you know, and it's Trump, you can see how Trump could charm some some of these people, right? Hundred percent. You get out 100%. there. You get up there. It's a fun game because you have total contempt for the media, as they right. actually deserve. So it's a game, yeah. asshole to asshole. Which asshole is gonna whatever? In the in this case, these people are full throatedly, at least yes. in the case of Kirby. Totally coldly. I mean, Max points out that um, Matthew Miller looks like Gargamel, a younger Gargamel, which he does. <laughs> and and then and then Corinne Jean Pierre, like morosely, uh, defending fucking genocide. Yeah, yeah. The diff yeah, it's it's a good point too because usually there's no pointed questions from the press pool, especially during like the lead up to Iraq and you know all right. of these heinous foreign policy endeavors that the U.S. Uh, unleashed after 9-11 but now you are seeing pointed questions about all of the war crimes almost daily in these conferences so so for the first time these people are just having to just lie and apologize for what are clear blatant war crimes over and over and over yes. again and just keep saying israel nope there's no evidence for that oh no israel's investigating themselves um or yeah we've seen the footage and it's not up to us israel's you know israel said that it was an accident oops i it, it's unbelievable to me i mean i don't know how these people sleep at night yeah. they're genocidal maniacs and i think that i think that we forget sometimes how genocidal and murderous and just flippant like our elected representatives truly are about yes. brown people yes i mean you see in the halls of congress people like medea benjamin and and just other constituents like asking i think it was like the senator from tennessee or something he was just like mm -hmm. kill them all Killed yes, them all, yes. and they were talking about kids. They were talking about kids. Children. Yes, yes. This is this is how these people think. Talking about we should we should drop a nuclear bomb on them like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That was some other asshole. Yes, some mm -hmm. congressman. I mean, I think we. I, this is who these people are, honestly. And and I and yeah, that might be the Republicans saying the most crazy stuff. But like we see how Democrats devalue and delelegitimize the lives of um brown people and we're seeing it clear as 100%. day yes clear yeah. as day it's almost it's like there's an added layer of offensiveness when it's democrats um because they are hiding their genocidal nature behind kind of like either whether it's you know um the idea of like mental health or 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 social justice, like they 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 couch it, whereas like mm -hmm. a Republican will literally just say kill them all, kill all the children. Yeah, they preempt their their apologies for Israel by being like, oh, we we yes, you know, we abhor the loss of civilian life on right. both sides. Yes, exactly. Plus, Which you know is they're like, going to pull the you know they're going to pull the lesser of two evils shit by telling you that the next election is existential by pretending they're different. 
Right. I think that, you know, fuck Jean Paul Sartre, the real existentialists are the Democrats because everything yeah. is fucking existential. <laughs> well, I had a gun to my head for 20 years as a young woman saying, you know, if you don't vote for the Democrats, your yes. right to abortion is going to be taken away. And that gun, that that metaphorical gun was seriously drove me at the beginning of my political awakening to like feel that like it was yes. existential for me. I had to go mm. and don't make fun of me. It was very embarrassing. I went on a swing state trip for John Kerry. I mean, that's how like driven I was. I was like, I, I, need, understand. I need to protect this. And then you just realize it's compl- they don't protect it themselves. Yes. Why are no. we fighting for these people if they're not going to codify Roe when they had the chance? Right. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to yell at us. For them being bad at winning elections when they, (laughs) you know, by just American sentiment based on polls, they should be winning elections. Yeah. Why doesn't status quoism? Why doesn't that excite the youth who are bankrupt and don't have enough money for for anything at all and who are grip, you know, gripped with debt? It's like, hmm, I don't know. It's not very exciting, is it? Status quoism and scolding. Yeah, climate catastrophe. Yes. If they they think that, you know, it's like the people they appeal to are only people who would give their left nut to be a fucking staffer in their, you know, campaigns. There's no one showing up at rallies for Biden. Like Trump has a cult following. Yes. Like Trump has a base that's very excited and will be driven to the polls to vote for him. Biden does not have that. Yes, just and he's refusing to build it. He's refusing right. to even try. And it's all, all I can think of is it's just based on uh, his own personal beliefs or, uh, you know, about like, uh, you know, they'll, they'll fucking, the, the people don't care about the Browns. Uh, or it's based on this like democratic, you know, uh, class, this like D triple C class of people who are just like, only thing that matters is money. We got to make these calls. We got to make sure that yeah. we don't piss off APAC and and nothing else matters, which is just like disgusting on a whole other level. Um, they keep trying to cater to this like fantasy right wing voter yes. who's a moderate who's just ready to become a Democrat. And they yes. do this every election. Right. Yes. And yeah. it never works because every Republicans blue are color, Republicans. <laughs> yeah. For, for, for every blue collar Democrat we lose in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania <laughs> or <laughs> Michigan. It's, it's, That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Schumer. Yeah. Um, <sighs> The Democrats are the ones who are most likely to use language like "we see you, we hear you." Mm-hmm. But in fact, but no Kente one cloth. feels literally no one feels seen or heard by the Democrats at this point. The only people who see who feel seen and heard as an actual experience are Trump voters, and that's why I know. they love him. Exactly. I know, and, exactly. and 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 he's only he is only just placating them. He's only throwing fish to the goddamn seals and watching them flap their fins. Like, they are not actually getting anything. They're getting rhetorical fish. Uh, 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 pronouns, right? You know, the gays. And like, and they're like, yeah, he's not doing anything to improve their lives, but he understands uh, that he's playing a media game and he's he understands what it is to do demagoguery and he's like but he is doing something for them matt no he actually is doing something i think we need to yeah 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 even on the grounds of you want to oppose him effectively yes and at this point yeah 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 i i i I, i'm a culture war draft dodger so yeah (laughs) but but even from the point of view if you want to defeat him you have to understand what he is doing for them and it's not small and it's not insignificant and i'm not going to deride them for it He's naming things that they yes. can completely see. He's making them feel less crazy because yes. they know that the mm. coastal elite look down mm. on them. They know that the expert class hates them and yes. reviles them. They know that this country is not set up for them if it ever was, you know? And so someone saying it gives them a, f- it's, it's oxygenating, you know? Yes. And the fact is no Democrat can do that because no Democrat tells the truth about anything. Yes. Trump's a fucking liar, but he's an honest liar. He's a hypocrite, yeah. but he's an honest hypocrite. You yes. Know? So like, I think that's 100 percent spot on. I think that's exactly right. I, 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 I do think that there's uh, there's something to be said for just the acknowledgement of your worldview and 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 and, and and experience and i don't even think it's like i'm not even talking about it from a, a place of like oh well these people their worldview is uh necessarily racist or sexist or anti-gay it's just you know whatever their worldview mm-hmm. is he is good at 
he's good at giving them a nice reflection of what their lived experience is and then kind of giving them a reason why they are in the position that they're they're in and then blaming you know pronouns or whatever the fuck um yeah but you know that is something that democrats also can't can't even do even in the midst of a genocide which is just fucking insane like i'm i yeah i'm supposed to be talking about the sopranos <laughs> about the wire <laughs> I am not supposed to be doing an entire podcast about this, but it's like literally the number one thing that Daniel and I get in terms of messages is like, thank you for saying that my eyes are not lying to me. And it's... Uh, See, we're doing what Trump is doing. Yes, we are. A hundred percent. Except for, you know, and we're... Some, uh, well, then someone should be, except... except you know, Except without pointing them in, the, in the direction of just kind of a generalized bigotry in order to like, you know, it's it's more Machiavellian, obviously, with him because he's doing it to get power. Whereas yeah, I'm we're just, trying to hum- we're trying to we're trying to I'm doing to it to avoid therapy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but we all right. We we got to we got to wrap this up. So I think I want to play just one piece of uh, Hasbara that um uh, a friend of the show, uh, Justin, uh, part of the OG Bad Has Bar Facebook group back in the day, sent to me. This is just uh, this is a lady named Shula. Um, and you may have seen her before. I, I don't know what the deal is with this, but this is like whenever any anyone like Emily Schrader or anyone talks who, you know, goes on these like big news shows and, you know, they, they've got their makeup on or whatnot. This is like the soul of that I see deep within them. So I'm gonna play this for you. Hi, I'm Shula. I'm a supporter of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Israel and the IDF must go into Rafah now. And this is also the only way to release our hostages. There is no other way. Hamas is not interested in peace. They're working with Biden to buy time. <laughs> because they know that at the end of the war they will lose because Biden in his election year will stop Israel from fighting, from giving us weapons. He only focuses on his policy, how to deal with the Muslims. Who are Hamas in Michigan, in Nevada, and other states, Arizona, how to deal with the radical leftists, who are also against Israel. Only Netanyahu will bring back the hostages. No one will bring them back. Bye, Shul. And then my name is Shul. I thought that was Laura Loomer. (laughs) who is that that is uh that is what laura loomer was desperately trying to avoid becoming when she went into her cosmetic surgeon and said i'm thinking the penguin from batman returns (laughs) an anorexic penguin that is creepy as hell man yeah just uh, like one of the most creepy ladies i've found since you know twitter decided to make their algorithm only zionists uh (laughs) that lady shula gets put on my feet all the time and i'm just like lord anyways biden you know, I want to say congrats uh, to you for such forward thinking, um, knowing that no matter what you do, Netanyahu uh, will never love you and his supporters will always think you are Hamas, no matter how much genocide you allow. Matt, yeah, we have even, Emily more Schrader, question, or... even Emily Schrader was like saying oh, Biden is just horrible on Israel. It's like, what else yes. do you, what else what do you, you want? possibly want? What else can you do? <laughs> It's like it just it just shows that they can't. Th- there is no winning. So like, right? No, exactly. From, from a position of just pure fucking strategy, what are you thinking? <laughs> thinking that they will help? Um, yeah, it is insane. We do have time for one more question, Daniel. So Abby, I think the first time I ever became aware of your work was your woman on the street interviews with Israelis. Yes, in Jerusalem. Uh, or Tel Aviv or wherever it was. And this was what, 2016? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you had your finger on the pulse that's pulsing now for the entire world to see, which is the 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 deterioration of whatever used to be humanistic and liberal in that society. Um, so you, 
you're going to be less surprised than your average person about what's happening now. Uh, but have you been surprised at all? And what did you see back then that were that? Were, can you tra can you just trace for us the sort of what what you were observing then and what we're seeing now and that the development of that, because something has exploded here, but it's been brewing for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was always like a socialist argument. And, you know, especially mm -hmm. with Bernie Sanders saying he stayed on this kibbutz and that there was a socialist project. And so it was always kind of hard to wrap your mind around how fascist Israeli society has become, because it really is worse than it's ever been. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people who are true leftists flee because they can. Um, a lot of them have dual, you know, citizenship and or passports that they can just leave Israel because why would you want to live in a society like that when it's actually dangerous to be a leftist? It actually is. There's there's um, lynch mobs and, and yes. people who will actually hunt you down and beat you up if, you know, there's a saying in Israeli society now that says um, Arabs are the common cold and leftists are AIDS. You can't get rid of the common cold unless you get rid of AIDS first. Um, you know, Dan. Wait, 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 what? So what's the leftist... medical reasoning behind that? <laughs> Don't ask me, ask them. No, but so I mean David you Sheen, should. who's also a, you know, a colleague, a, a mutual colleague of ours. I mean, he's filmed some of these fascist strongholds of rallies of tens of thousands of people in Tel Aviv chanting death to the leftists and death mm -hmm. to the videographers because they hate Betzalem for filming yeah, the atrocities that they commit because then it creates widespread attention for the Palestinian plight. When I was there in 2016, I was very taken aback by how fascist and openly genocidal Israelis were. I spent yeah. a month in the West Bank. I talked to hundreds of Palestinians. Not one person ever said anything remotely anti-Semitic, remotely genocidal. And I even spoke to someone whose house was being attacked constantly when a settlement was encroaching right on his house. They were throwing rocks at his windows. They set fire to his car. And he just said, why can't they just live there? Why do they have to move right on top of my home? In this village, he was like, I don't care if they live here, just live in empty land right there and we can be neighbors. Um, and so you compare that to going into Jerusalem in a place called Tolerance Square, where you're just in a suburban, like open air mall where there's like Sephora behind these idiots talking to me. And I mean, honestly, people have tried to paint this just sampling of Israeli society as like, I concocted this, I, you know, I'm the one who put this together to make Israelis look as bad as possible. No, amazingly, this is, this is who they are. This was a random sampling of everyone that I talked to put together. And it was just within two hours. Um, and everyone espoused genocidal rhetoric against Palestinians or just said they should be ethnically cleansed. Maybe not killed, but just expelled. Yeah, that's my the land favorite one. Maybe them. not killed. Don't ki maybe not kill <laughs> them. Don't kill them. Don't People, kill them. Just make them just, go away. Uh, yeah, just, and, and so yeah, I, this, is, this is why you never see Israelis uh, on camera from Western media. I mean, it's like I was yeah. saying before, yeah. they have a very curated reality that they put over with their spokespeople to talk to our news media and our politicians. You never just see news people from corporate media or Western media going and putting a camera in the face of Israelis. And that's exactly why. And so, yeah, I was not surprised because I, you know, especially during the Great March of Return, seeing some of these polls mm -hmm. showing that 95% of Israelis agreed with the 2014 bombing campaign in Gaza. 98% of them agreed with the shoot to kill policy and unarmed protesters in the mm -hmm. Great March of Return. So it, it's just a natural conclusion that this is this is what would happen, especially in the aftermath of something like October 7th. You would see such a fervor take take hold in Israeli society that would just become nearly unanimous. And it wasn't until several months into this genocide that you saw just a handful of protesters finally saying this is too much. I mean, I even went to an anti-refugee rally in Tel Aviv and I spoke to someone who said, I'm a member of the Labor Party. I'm a leftist and we need to expel all immigrants. These people bring their multitude of problems over here. We need to kick them out. And even in the random sampling of Israelis, if you watch that whole video um, where they were all genocidal talking about Palestinians, one of them said, I'm a leftist uh, and, and I just think the occupation should be more humane. That's yeah. what it means to be a leftist. So even at that point, I knew there was something very, very deeply fascistic and sick about the society. And that's why I was advocating BDS for the longest time, because I just said, look, there's simply no hope from within Israeli society. It's not that there's not leftists there. It's just that they're so drowned out. And it's just frankly too late because the Likudniks, I mean, look at Netanyahu back in 1978. He's mm -hmm. he's on the floor. I, I don't know where he is somewhere 
in Israel just saying there's never going to be a Palestinian state. And it's just like the fact that this farce has been perpetrated and, and told to us for generations is, is so insulting. Yeah. And it's still told to us. Yeah. And, and it's left my... to Sino and Israel mm. are encouraging BDS or something similar, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I encourage genuinely. BDS here too. It's like I, yeah. you know, and we're not nearly as fascist in terms of our actual people that live here as Israelis are. But like this, yeah. I, I encourage people to boycott this country too. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think my my big fear, and I hate to end on a fear, <laughs> <laughs> but my big fear about you know this is um, about you know kind of this more recent like change and um what seems like a, a change in public opinion in the United States, at least in our weirdo fucking Democrat political class, um, is that this will, that, that will repeat the mistakes of um, uh, what happened with Israel's uh, 1982 invasion of Lebanon um, and how deeply unpopular it was and led to, you know, the first intifada. And then it, this kind of, um, uh, this peace effort that happened. My my fear is the placation of the American public via fake peace efforts because I think we're now at the point like where, you know, in the past we had this long drawn out fake peace process, and so because of that we were able to pacify uh, people in Western countries. Uh, to be like, well, someone's working on that peace process, mm -hmm. you know. Still working on that. Yeah, still working on it. But don't worry, we're almost there. <laughs> Just gotta cross a few T's, dot a few I's. Um, keep shuffling the papers. I yeah, I gotta. Yeah, there's, something, there's an extra paper in there. There's a page. I gotta. There's footnotes. But yeah, uh, and you know, I think it's been pretty clear for you know at least the last eight you know, last decade that uh, the peace process is a total farce. And I think, um, you know, the Israelis haven't even really tried to pretend it's anything other than a farce. I think well, this is the I, thing, I Matt. I, it's going to be. Yeah, go ahead. Well, just I can allay your fear, but it's going to I'm going to the, the answer is going to be more horrible than what your fear is. Oh, great. There isn't going to be a peace process this time because this time they've destroyed. One entire section of palace like of, of occupied palace like they've gone yeah. full ham yes. on gaza there's going to be no one left there's no there's no it, it's not like it was a you know an uprising here and there and right the PLO could be then pacified and co-opted and then make the mistake of supporting iraq in the first gulf war and all of the shit that gave israel some leverage and led to oslo and you had rabin and clinton there's there's no negotiated permanent solution to this. Yeah. Uh, which is, yeah, I, I just don't see what yeah. kind yeah, of no, peace there's no, process could emerge there's from none. this. Yeah, because like you just said, Gaza's been completely decimated. This is worse than the Nakba when you're looking at just the sheer numbers of people who yeah. are going to be forcibly expelled. And the West Bank's so atomized, there's no possible state there. Yeah. So I think that Israel um, has completely lost the moral high ground. There's no one that's going to possibly believe that they're acting in good faith from this point forward. And so yeah. I think people are looking at this with wide and clear eyes, looking that Israel has gone further than they ever have. There's no turning back from them. And and once you once international human rights organizations and even Israeli human rights organizations are calling it an apartheid state, the answer then becomes, what can we do about eliminating apartheid? It's it, You can't backpedal from that and right. walk that back. So now, That's like right. I said before, we were on the defense for so long. Now the Zionists are on the defense and that's going to be their future now. And yeah. so I think I think that the time is coming for a true democracy and liberation for the Palestinian people. It's very, very unfortunate that it had to come on the heels of a, a massacre of this magnitude. But I, I truly think there's a new internationalist movement growing and pro-Palestinian, you know, Palestinian liberation is at the forefront of that. And finally, taking into account how all of these struggles link together and how they're all kind of appendages of, of U.S. empire. And I, I'm here for it. I think it's beautiful yeah. mm -hmm. and um, very motivating. And I think that we're going to win. That is a positive message to end the show on. I think we're going to win. 
That would be so I sick. I had to say it. I love it. I love it. And uh, and I love you, Abby. You're fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast and, and talking uh, about Israel and stuff with us. Thank you both so much. Huge fan of you both. It was wonderful to talk to you. And hopefully we'll do it again. Uh, yeah. yeah love thanks for you all back. your work over the years, Abby. Yes. Like really a stalwart, just a hero of this whole independent journalism space, not just on this issue, but on so many things. And yes. Like, yeah, just just big appreciation. Yeah, Thanks you so rule. much, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Daniel Mate, for coming on and, you know, being my my sometimes co-host when he can be on here. Daniel, do you have anything well, to I'm sure, plug? Well, I'm sure you're very welcome. Uh, do I have anything <laughs> to plug? I have, yeah. I have the country of Ireland to plug. I just spent 10 oh. days there, and I have never, ever seen one country be so in solidarity with another. I'm talking about, oh. I, I was in, like, Three different Irish pubs full of Irish people singing from the river to the sea, Palestine will oh. be free, singing songs about Palestine in Gaelic. Mm. Um, there were times when I couldn't tell if the songs were in Gaelic or in Arabic. Like that, there's a kind oh, of I love spiritual that. pen pal thing going on here that's really incredible. So just a shout out to the people of shout Ireland. Shout out to Ireland. Plug to Ireland. Yeah. Follow Ireland on Twitter at Go visit Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buy some Lucky Ireland's Charm. got some great content you know that they, they, they you know yeah they got great content they're you know they they got our our, our boy Tig and uh so much other things uh our boy Colin WB8s Farrell. uh yeah yeah uh, yeah he's yeah. cool but yes yeah, thank you so much for coming on and thank you to everyone out there uh for listening I love you all uh and patreon.com slash bad has barra bad has barra gmail.com questions comments concerns send it all to us and all right everyone until next time from the river to the sea this is the first time i heard an israeli say sorry 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 jumping jacks was us push-ups was us Krav Maga us all karate us Pinky Molly, us, Michael Jackson, us, Yamaha keyboards, us, George Jumping's not us, Andor was us, Heath Ledger Joker, us, Sandwich Ledger, us, Happy Meals was us, McDonald's was us, Being Happy, us, Pico Yoga, us, Eating Food, us, Breathing Air, us, Drinking Water, us. We invented all that shit. <laughs>